Welcome to Teaching the Truth with Pastor Eric C. Bogan. Clearly define what I am to do. Let every word penetrate the heart. Let what is said lead them running to your arms. Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. Let's turn in our Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. I want to continue um, to talk to you today about a, a subject that we introduced last week entitled The Power of His Resurrection. The Power of His Resurrection. And we, we introduced it to you on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, but the resurrection is not just for Easter. Oh, come on, somebody. We need to be believing in the resurrection every day. We'll talk about it. Philippians chapter 3, if you remember, we took a look at verse 10. Notice Philippians 3 and 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. Again, that I may what? Know him and the power of his resurrection, that I may know him. Is that your desire today, to know him? Now, some of you out there might say, well, I already know him, bless God. You know, I've been saved for quite a while now. I've been knowing Christ. I've been knowing God for a while since I was a little child. Well, I'll say to you, you don't know him as you ought to know him. I'm not saying you don't know him. I'm saying you don't know him as you ought to know him. Hebrews chapter 5. In other words, there are degrees in which we can know the Lord. How many know that? There, there are degrees. There are varying degrees in which we can know God. You don't know him all at once. We're growing. We should be growing in our knowledge. And the fact is, most people don't know him as much as they think they know him or as they ought to know him. And we see this here in Hebrews 5, verse 12. For when the time you ought to be teachers, you who say you know the Lord, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern or to know both good and evil. He says, you say you know, but you don't know as you ought to know. In fact, you ought to be teachers. As much as you claim to know, as much as you've heard. But just because you've heard doesn't mean you've been listening. Just because you've been in class don't mean you've been learning. He says, you don't know as you ought to know. And he describes for us two kinds of individuals. He says there are, first of all, babies. He calls them babes. Or those who know something about God, but don't know him like they ought to know him. They're babies. We got quite a few of those in the body of Christ. Still on the milk. And then he says, there are also, there are also individuals who he calls mature persons because they habitually practice or they 
use what they learn. See, that's really the difference between knowing him and really knowing him. Are you using what you've learned? He says, they are of full age by reason of use. They take what they heard and they use it. That word use there literally means to habitually practice something. They're taking what they hear and they putting it to practice. It is those individuals that know as they ought to know. People who just hear messages but never put those messages to practice, at least not habitually, you're still a baby. We got a lot of babies that like to study but don't like to do it. See, we think we're mature because we can quote half the New Testament. We think we're mature because we know facts about Christ. But if you're not doing what you've learned, then the Bible says you're still a baby. Why a baby? Because babies need others to do for them. They need others to carry them. They need others to take them from one place to another. But a mature person is someone who takes what they learn, takes what they hear, and puts it to use. And he says, these are they who really know because they are able to discern. That word means to know. They know the difference between good and evil. They know how to discern what is truly righteous. See, a lot of us don't really know what righteousness is because we've never done it. You know, like these, these individuals who graduate from college with a degree but then come on a job. Oh, I, there you go. You might run into one. I done touched the nerve. Yeah, they come right on this job. and I, done, I got experience. But then they, they want to tell you it works this way, but I'm trying to tell them it don't work the way you read in a book. That's book knowledge. But when you get down there on that line, you'll realize it don't quite work that way. You need some experience. I mean, no, experience is a different kind of knowledge. They don't teach you that in school. You got to learn that by doing it. And the body of Christ is filled with a lot of college graduates with no experience. And as a result, they don't know Christ. They don't know his righteousness as they ought to. They don't know how to discern, no, that's God, that's not God. That's righteous, that's not righteous. That's what God is looking for, that's not what God is looking for. So you think just because people have been in church half their life, they know what God is looking for. But the fact is, most of the people that have been here a long time still don't know what God is looking for. They still haven't figured this thing out. That's why they cuss you out in the parking lot. Because they're still learning. Now the writer here, he goes on to say, and this is important, he describes those persons that are mature, that are taking what they're learning and putting it to use. Those who, who know how to discern between good and evil, good and evil, he describes them as people who are of full age. He says they are of full age. And the words full age in verse 14, it means perfected. It means perfected. People who are putting the word to use are reaching perfection. In fact, notice what he says in verse 1 of chapter 6, the very next verse, chapter 6 and verse 1. Therefore, so he's, he's continuing in this, in, in this line of thought. He says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, let us go on to what? Same word as a full age. Let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God. 
He says, individuals who are putting what they've learned to practice, these are they who are going on to perfection. He's associating knowing Christ as we ought to know him as perfection. Go with me to Philippians chapter 3. Go back to chapter 3 of Philippians. Mm. People who are striving for a full understanding of Christ are individuals who are going on to perfection. And that's the commandment. He tells us, go on to perfection. Okay, you started out, but you can only be a baby for so long. It's time for you to go on to perfection, go on to maturity. Here in Philippians, notice in chapter 3, this is where we, we started our text. In verse 10, Philippians 3 and 10, that, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his, his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, verse 12, not as though I had already attained, that is the resurrection, either were already what? Perfect. But I follow after. Follow after what? Perfection, if that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Paul says, I'm desiring to know him in resurrection. And he calls that knowledge, knowing him in resurrection, he calls that perfection. I'm striving to know him. I'm striving for perfection because that's what perfection is. It's a full and complete knowledge. It's not just a head knowledge. It's a knowledge of experience. And we said this to you last week. When Paul says, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection, he's saying, I want to experience the power of his resurrection. And for those who attain to that, he calls that perfection. Most people aren't interested in attaining to perfection. In fact, we don't talk much about perfection because we see perfection as something that's reserved for the next life. Remember, we said this about this whole idea of the resurrection. When we think of the resurrection, we only think of it as an event that will happen at the end of this world. But Paul is teaching us here in Philippians that he wants to know it now. That is, there's something about the resurrection that we can know, we can experience right now. In the same way, Paul says this should be our attitude towards perfection. That we ought not be thinking of perfection as something that we try, that we receive at the end of our life or in another life or in heaven. We should be seeking to attain it now. And people don't do that. We, we have, for the most part, most people don't talk about perfection. They're not striving for perfection in Christ because they see perfection as something that God will do for them in the next life. No matter how I live down here, just, you know, how nasty I am, that at the end, he's going to just erase all of that. And then he's going to just make everything about me perfect. So I'm going to just leave that to God and I'm going to focus my life right now on bettering my life, enjoying my life. Not reaching for perfection, God's going to do that at the end. That's something that happens at the end. John chapter 11. John chapter 11. But we're trying to change that. I said we're trying to change that. I'm trying to, that's what babies do. Babies wait for, for their parents to do it. They don't try to obtain it. That's what babies do. They wait for you to buy them some shoes. They, they wait for you to, to pay all their bills. That's what babies do. But when you're grown, when you're mature, you try to do it yourself. You're asking, teach me how you did that so I can do it. But babies don't want to do it. 
You ever see someone who always wants you to do everything for them? They're babies. You're a baby. You don't, you don't ever want to do it. You just want someone to do it for you. Oh, you want to you wanna learn about it. You'll watch YouTube videos on it, but you ain't going to ever do it. You got all kind of do-it-yourself books, but you're not going to do it yourself. Hmm. John chapter... We just, want, we, we just think it's conversation when we're around the water cooler. We think it's conversation when we're at dinner. Oh, you know, you know, this is how you really do that. You, but you never did it. You're always trying to teach people how to do stuff, but you never did it. Hmm. Okay. John 11. How many want to grow up? How many Toys R Us kids out there that want to grow up? Yeah, you thought I forgot. John 11, 23, John 11, 23, Jesus said to her, thy brother shall rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. <laughs> you see what just happened? <laughs> okay, if you didn't, let me, let me help you. This is a situation where Martha's brother, Lazarus, has recently died. I mean, he died four days ago, actually, four days from this time. Jesus arrived on the scene. And Jesus comes to Martha, and he, he basically gives her good news. He says, Martha, I'm here now. And he says, your brother is going to rise again. She says, Lord, I know. We all going to rise in the last day. All the saints will be caught up. Them who, are, them who are died in Christ will rise first, and we which are alive shall be caught up. I know the scriptures. What Martha was doing, Martha was dismissing what Jesus said in terms of seeing a resurrection. She was dismissing that because in her mind, the resurrection was something reserved for a particular time, the last day. We don't have resurrection now. The resurrection is for another time. But Jesus wanted to change that. Jesus wanted Martha and us to understand that you don't have to wait to experience the resurrection. You don't have to wait for that. Will there be a resurrection at the end of the, end, of the, end of the world? Yes. Is there going to be a resurrection in the last day? Yes. But Jesus says, guess what? I'm here, so you don't have to wait for that. See, this is why we pray for healing. Will there be healing in the next life? Absolutely. But do we have to wait for that? No. We can have it. We can experience it now. He says, Martha... I need to change your thinking. You've stopped trying to strive to obtain resurrection because you see it only as something reserved for a particular time. But I want you to know that you can experience resurrection now. And you want to know why? Martha's about to, I mean, Jesus is about to tell Martha, because I'm the resurrection. The resurrection is not an event, it's a person. If you receive the person, you receive the power. Look at verse 25, John 11 and 25. Jesus said to her, notice, I am. Not I'm bringing it, I am. You're, you're saying you're going to see the resurrection, you're staring at the resurrection. He didn't say, I have the power to produce resurrection. He didn't say, I have the power to bring the past resurrection. He says, I'm is. I'm is. I'm is. I'm is the resurrection. You never forget that. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth, and believeth in me shall never die. 
Do you believe this? That's my question to you. Do you believe this? Somebody say, believe what? Because really there's two things he's asking if you believe. In these two verses, Jesus has really made two different statements. They're not the same. They're different. For instance, he says to them that those who believe in him, if they were dead, they're going to live. Meaning, there's a faith in Christ that if you die will cause you to be delivered from death or be delivered from the second death or be delivered from eternal judgment. Go with me to Romans chapter five. You can believe in the resurrection and your faith in the resurrection will cause you to escape eternal judgment. Now, you may physically die, but you're not going to die the ultimate death, which is eternal separation from God. Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath. That's that eternal judgment through him. For if when we were sinners, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life by his resurrection. See, if we believe that his blood was justification, atone for our sin, remove the judgment, we stopped being accounted as sinners in his sight, we were forgiven. Then he says, if you believe that, if you believe that because he died and shed his blood, that you will be forgiven of, you are forgiven of all your sins, his resurrection means that you will not, even if you die, you will not suffer eternal wrath, but you too will be raised. Look at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. This is, this is the gospel that we preach to sinners. Amen. This is a message to sinners, not perfect persons, that because of what Jesus did, if you believe in that, because he got up, even if you die, you're going to get up. You're going to be saved from eternal judgment. Here in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God raised who? Him from the dead. Thou shalt be what? Saved from what? Eternal judgment. If you want to be saved from eternal judgment, wrath, eternal separation from God, all you have to do is believe that Jesus rose again for your justification. And that's what he means when he says, if you, if you are dead, you're going to live. But he gives another statement. He says, if you believe on me, if you live, you will never die. He's saying, you can believe on me that if perhaps you die, don't worry, your soul will not see corruption. For to be absent from the body is to be what? I'm going to deliver you from the, from the power of the grave. But you can believe on me, he goes on to tell Martha. You can believe on me to the point that you will never die. Go with me to 2nd, 1 Corinthians 15. Mm, there's a faith. There's a knowing 
there's a knowing of the resurrection that will deliver you not only from eternal punishment, but it will deliver you from death itself. Hallelujah. Oh, I know, I know, I know, I know. But this is what Jesus said. Notice in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Stop right there. Look, look, so you see what's happening. So he's, he's, he's talking about two victories. He says, death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? That's two different things. Because how many know you can die and still win the victory over the grave? The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Even if we die, the, the grave doesn't win because he took the keys from, from the grave, the Bible says. And he delivered us from the grave. So now, even when we die, we don't go to the grave. Where do we go? We go to be with the Lord. But he says in this passage, not only has he gained the victory over the grave, but he says, death, where is your sting? Meaning, he's given us the victory over death as well. And how has he done that? Look at the next verse, verse 56. The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. I told you, you got everything you need. He's already done it. Thanks. Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory, not through our efforts, through our Lord, Jesus Christ. Giving us the victory. The victory over what? The two things he just named. The grave and death. Now we said to you that we have victory over the grave by believing that God raised Jesus from the dead. What gives us victory over death? We have victory over death because Jesus also won the victory over sin. Because the penalty of our sin is death. People die because of sin. He says, oh, that means everybody who died was a sinner. That's the difference between having sin and being a sinner. Death is always the cause of, I mean, uh, sin is always the cause of death, of sickness. It may not be attributed to you as sin, because the Bible says he came to die for our sins that we might receive atonement or forgiveness. But that doesn't mean sin isn't there. And if sin isn't dealt with, you will ultimately die. Everyone who dies, you know that sin was the cause. You cannot die if there is no sin. That's the whole point of removing our sin so that we don't die. So why is it that we still die? Well, because there's still sin there. That doesn't mean we're sinners. We can still have victory over the grave and yet not be sinless. That's the gospel. See, people don't want to hear that. They think you've got to be perfect to escape the grave. No, you don't. You have to have faith in Christ. That he is the sacrifice for your sin. And so even while we were yet sinners, Christ died not for the righteous, for the unrighteous. That's where our faith is. Even though I haven't been perfect, he was perfect for me. I believe that. And if you continue to believe that, even to the point of death, he says, your body, I mean, your soul will not see corruption you will escape the grave. But Jesus has given us another promise. He came not just to give us forgiveness. He came to conquer sin and death. He conquered death by overcoming sin. How did he overcome sin? He t 
tells us right here in verse 56, the sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. You know how he overcame sin? By doing away with the law. Go with me to Colossians chapter two. Come on, stay with me. <laughs> he overcame the law and therefore delivered us from sin. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Colossians chapter two, verse 14. Speaking of Christ, he says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us and took it, what? The handwriting of ordinances. He took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. We learn here that Christ, when he was nailed to the cross, he blotted out, he canceled. He removed the handwriting of ordinances, which means the law. He took that out of the way because it was against us. It was what was constantly bringing condemnation against us. It was the thing that was keeping us from walking pleasing to God. So what he did was when he died on the cross, he bore the penalty of the law in the flesh. And by doing that, he did away not only with the law, he did away with our old man. He did away with our, the part of us that constantly keeps disobeying God. That was on the cross. So you know what that means? That when he was on the cross, he didn't just die for him. He died for us and not just for our sins. We died with him. That was us on the cross. And so when he died, now the law can no longer have any condemnation against us because according to the word, we were on the cross. And once you died, the law has no more power over you. See, once you die, the police can't arrest you. Your record has been cleared. You don't arrest dead people. The IRS doesn't come looking for payment from dead people. All your debts are canceled because you're dead. Some of you want to die now to get rid of all this debt. You just want to, I wish I would just, no, don't, don't do that in Jesus' name. But we think that way. This is why a lot of people are, 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 are persuaded to, to take their life. They're trying to escape the condemnation, the record. The thing they say, well, I can't get over this. They're trying to escape it. But you don't have to escape it. He, just, he took it out the way. He removed it. Not only did he take away your sins, but he took the standard by which you're trying to please God away. So no longer try to please God according to, I'm taking that all out the way. Don't look at the law anymore. Because when I died, you died. Romans chapter six, let me show you. See, but this is something we don't believe in. We, we're believing God to forgive our sins, but we're not believing that we've died with Christ and had overcome our sins. See, you can believe Christ was raised for your justification, or you can also believe that you were raised with Christ. Not only do you have justification, but you can walk in righteousness. It's a different kind of faith. Romans chapter 6. Yes, this is the gospel. Verse 4, therefore, we are buried, no, notice, with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been planted, that word means united, if we are united together in the likeness of his death, then we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is not going to be 
is crucified, notice, with him. That the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not. This is it right here. You know what gives you the victory over sin? You know what gives you the power to no longer serve sin and be under the dominion of the I can't help it? It's for you to identify with Christ. That when he died, you died. And that when he rose, everyone who identifies with Christ's resurrection will receive power over sin. And those who receive power over sin has the potential never to die. Because it's the sin that causes you to die. This is the reason why Paul says some will be alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. You know who those persons will be? Those who overcome sin. Everyone else will die. But he will have some. He will have a witness of some who have overcome. See, everything God does, remember, when Jesus came, he came to fulfill all the word of God. There is no promise that God has given that will not be fulfilled. And if there is a promise for us to overcome sin and death, guess what? Heaven and earth won't pass away until that word is fulfilled in the body of Christ. See, but most people aren't looking for it. They're like Martha. Oh, you know, that's, that's something I'm putting off to the end. But Paul says that I may know him. Not only as my sacrifice, but that I may know him, that I have died with him and been raised with him. That's the challenge. That's, the, that's what's being told to us, that we need to identify with him. So many people are trying to please God instead of realizing that Christ, he's the one that can please God. Remember, they told Jesus, they said, oh, good master. And he says, no one is good. That means if you see me doing good, it's not me who's doing it, but it's Christ. You want to know why you keep coming up short in your Christian life? Because you're trying to do it. You're trying to do it yourself. Go with me to Romans chapter 10. Yeah, you're trying to, you can't do it. You can't do it. You need to identify with Christ. That's the victory over sin. It's not you saying, God, I can do it. It's saying, God, I believe that my old man, which couldn't do it, died, and now there's a new man living in me. And that new man is Christ Jesus. And I can do all things through who? Christ. Through my efforts, Christ. through my willpower, Christ. through my education. I can do all things through Christ, and we can add, that lives in me. That strengthens me. When you praise, you should be seeing Jesus praising the Father through you. When you lay hands, you should be seeing Jesus laying hands through you. When you're praying, you should see Jesus praying through you. When you're walking in your daily life, you should see Christ. That's the key to victory. And the moment you start seeing yourself, that's when you fall off the plank. That's when you lose your balance. Okay, watch. Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Mm, that's my prayer. Save the church. Yeah, we're not saved, not as we ought to be saved. Verse 2, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. They have a zeal for God, but not according. <laughs> See, look at that. They, 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 they're, they're running around the church, but they don't know what pleases God. They're rolling underneath the pews, but they don't get it. They're carrying big Bibles, wearing long dresses, but they still haven't figured it out. This is not the way. They don't do any work on Saturday, on the Sabbath, but they have no knowledge. They're still missing it. How are they missing it, Paul? Well, he tells us. Verse 3, 
for they being ignorant of God's righteousness, going about to establish their own righteousness and have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes that when he died, you died. That believe when he rose, you rose. He's the end of the law. He's the end of trying to not work on the Sabbath and, and trying to do this. He's the end of that. Now it's all about Christ. I'm going to just let you do it because you know best. You know how to please the Father. You know how to be good. And I'm going to present my body as a living sacrifice, as a vessel, as an instrument of righteousness through which you can serve God. See, we don't think that way. We keep asking God, show me. I'm not, I don't want to show you. I can't, I've been trying to show you and you won't listen. You can't do it. And what you need to do is submit. I can't do it. That's the only reason why he came, because you couldn't do it. He says he came because the law was weak through the flesh. The flesh can't please God. So he says, you know what? I'm going to just take this out the way. And I'm going to suffer the penalty of every sin they commit. I'm suffer the penalty of that sin. And therefore, pay off the law. Okay, so now that you got what you wanted, law, so go over there and have a seat. And now I'm the new law. Instead of serving the law, do what I say. Let me lead. Let your soul get behind your spirit. Let your mind get behind your spirit, which is Jesus. Because it came out of heaven. You've been born again. So that spirit that's inside of you is in the image of Christ. He's the image of true holiness. And what you got to do is get your soul behind your spirit and say, whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do. Whatever you tell me to say, I'm going to say. And I'm going to be led by the spirit, not just the Holy Ghost. It's your spirit, which is God. That's what he's trying to say. He's like, See, when we think of being led by the spirit, we just think of running around and speaking in tongues. No, 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 no. Be led by the spirit that he created and put inside of you. That's Jesus. And get behind it. We're not, we're not submitting to his righteousness. We're trying to achieve our own righteousness. I don't care. You can, you can leave one denomination and go to another one. Or you can go non-denomination. They all got rules. They all got their own way of righteousness. Hold your hand like this, you know. Do this. You know, all these little things. And we think if we do all that, then we, we're really saved. But all we're doing is trying to establish, we want to pat on the back and say, I did it, I conquered. Like we, like we, like we try to conquer our, our garden outside our house. Like we try to, you know, conquer the lawn. Like we try to conquer our career. We think we can conquer righteousness. You cannot, you cannot. He's already won the victory. Get behind it and submit to it and say, this is no longer my life. My body is not my own. I've been bought with the price. Therefore, let me glorify Christ. You know what it means to glorify Christ? It's to do what he say, let you live through him. Let him live through you. That's what Jesus says, I glorify the Father. How did he do that? By letting the Father work through him. The words that I speak are not mine, but the Father. The things that I do is not my works, but the Father. Therefore, he was glorifying the Father. It was the Father who was doing the works. We glorify Christ by letting Christ do the work. So now he's the one who gets the credit, not us. So many of us are willing to accept Christ as an offering, but we won't receive 
his resurrection as a gift, something that we unite behind. We'll let Christ be our offering, but we won't let Christ, we won't let our bodies be his temple. We're believing a half gospel. We're believing half of what he came to give us. We'll let him be our offering but we won't receive his righteousness to walk it out. And that's really the, the problem that we're having in the body of Christ, even with all this, you know, grace doctrine. And it's just people lining up on one side or the other. So you got a whole bunch of people with this grace doctrine that said God did everything for us. So now we can just go out there and be nasty and he still forgive us. And then you got this other group that's saying, no, no, we got to do something. Everybody's got to do something. And the reason why the thing, the situation is the way it is, because ain't nobody doing right. So we need to all do right. So they go around hitting people over the head and say, be righteous, be righteous. And you ask them, how do I be right? Just do what I do. Say what I say, you know. And both of them are ignorant. Both of them don't get it. Both of them lack discernment. Yeah, he died for your sins. Yes, he died for you while you were yet a sinner. And yet he intercedes for you before the Father so that in case you do die, you won't have to suffer the penalty of death. But he don't want you to stay there. He wants you to go on to perfection. We just get this whole forgiveness, this get out of jail free card, and we just camp there. He says, no, I didn't die on the cross so you can camp here. I died on the cross so that you can enter into the promised land. Did, G, did God bring the Israelites out of Egypt to leave them in the wilderness? No, he brought them out to bring them in. I said he brought them out to bring them in. And a lot of us are still in the wilderness. We've come through the blood. we come through the Red Sea. But we haven't entered into the promise. He wants us to take possession. He wants us to take possession. He wants us to walk in righteousness. He wants us to have authority over everything that's having authority over us. Because he's given us complete victory. He's triumphed over the enemy. But the only problem is we're trying to go into the promised land in our own strength. We're trying to go as our own person instead of as Jesus. Hallelujah. And then you got a whole group of people. Just read the Old Testament. You had three tribes that said, you know what? We're good on this side. We ain't in Egypt. We don't really need the promised land. We got grass. Our, our flocks got grass. I mean, we're good here. We're going to make a life for ourselves right here. And we're going to reserve the promise to another life. Look, he says that here in, 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 in Romans 10. Look at verse 6, the very next verse. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. What is he saying here? He's saying the righteousness that is of faith does not say that in order for me to be righteous, I got to ascend into heaven. I'll be holy when I die. I'll be like him when he comes. You have reserved righteousness for something that takes place in heaven. That's not what a person who, who is standing on the righteousness of God does. He doesn't, they don't put their righteousness off into heaven. He says, neither do they say, let's wait until Christ be brought up from the grave. Meaning they didn't put it off for the resurrection. You know, when the resurrection comes, then I'll be changed, you know. No, God wants you to change right now. In fact, he says, this is what a person who really believes in the righteousness says. Look at verse 8. He tells us, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. You know what a person who is righteous by faith says? He says, we can do it right now. See, that was the difference between Joshua and Caleb. And the, and, the, and, the, and the bad witnesses, the, the other, what was it, 10 witnesses that brought a, a bad report, the Bible says. 
It says Joshua and Caleb was of a different spirit. You know what they were saying? They weren't saying we couldn't do it. They weren't saying, man, we need to wait on this next generation of kids. And when they grow up, maybe they can do it. He says, no, no, we're, we're able to have it right now. They are bred for us. They had the spirit of righteousness. They had the spirit of faith. People, listen to me. If we're going to walk in this righteousness, if we're going to attain to this pre perfection, this resurrection that Paul spoke about in Thess in Philippians chapter 3, then let us speak it. Let us put it in our mouth. So often we're trying to put the word in our hands and in our feet before we first put it in our mouth. The reason why we can't walk this thing out because we won't speak this thing out. We keep saying, I can't do it. It's too hard. It's too difficult. No, the first step to reaching to this perfection is begin to change the way you talk. It is possible. I am dead with Christ. I am risen with him. It's no more I who live, but Christ who lives in me. We won't change the way we talk. No wonder we can't change the way we walk. Joshua chapter 1. This is the key. We're trying to get people to change their walk without changing their talk. You can't do it. You can't do it. You got to stop saying you can't. He's already done it. You want to get healed? You got to say it first. You got to get it in your mouth and in your heart before it gets in your flesh. God doesn't work from the outside in. He works from the inside out. He doesn't change your body. He changes your soul. He says, I wish above all that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prosper. So your outside will reflect your inside. God doesn't want your outside to be more saved than your inside. Save the inside and the outside. And the reason why we can't get our, our bodies healed, our families healed, the reason why we can't walk in righteousness, because our heart is sick. Our mouth is sick. There's something wrong with our heart and something wrong with our mouth. And God says, if you would just say it, and if you get it in your heart, he says, your body will come along. See, if the Israelites, when they saw the giants, would have just said, even if they didn't feel strong, if they would have just said we could do it, then the power would be supplied to them. And your power isn't being supplied or power isn't being supplied to you because you won't say it. It's difficult because you won't say it. I see people all the time struggling to receive promises from God, healing, the Holy Spirit, whatever it is, because you won't say it. You won't put it in your mouth. You keep waiting on God to do something on the outside in. He says, no, it starts on the inside out. You got to say, oh, God, I thank you. I got it. That's what the old timers would tell you to say. You want to be filled. You got to say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, 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 thank you. No, 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 no. But this generation, I want to feel it. Let me see if I don't, I don't know. I don't have it yet. They said, that's your problem. You got to, you got to, you got to, you got to receive it before you feel it. You got to see it before you see it. You got to speak it. Roman de fecha colos. You got to say it before it comes. Open your mouth and I'll fill it. He don't give you the words and then you open. You open it and he will fill it. That's how you do it. This is our problem. This is why we can't walk in righteousness because we won't speak righteous. We won't say it. We won't say I am the righteousness of God. I'm not a liar. He's took lying out of my tongue. I'm not an adulterer. He's taken adultery away from me. I have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. It's no more I who live. It's Christ. Christ. Christ ain't adulterer. Christ is not a liar. Christ is not an idol worshiper. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. And this book of the law, and this book of the law, and this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Why? To get it in your heart. To get it in your heart. He says, and thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written. For then 
thou shalt make thy way prosperous. And then you're going to have kids success. We don't have success because it's not in our mouth. We're not having success because it ain't in our hearts. And it's not in our hearts because we ain't been meditating on it. It's not in our hearts because we put it off for another time. When I get done, you know, graduating from college, when I finish with my career, when, after I get married and have kids, you know, no, no, now, 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 right now, now. Once, once they make me pastor, once I become a missionary, well, once, once, no, no, right now, right now, right now. When I just walk in the door, after I just gave my life to God, right now, right now, am I the righteousness of God? I'm not waiting right now. I speak the word of God. I have overcome all of my enemies. I'm no longer under the dominion of my sin. Jesus Christ has delivered me for when he died, I died. I was planted with him and I am risen with him. Oh, you got to change the way you speak. Everyone standing on your feet today. Hallelujah. We'll never see change in our lives until we have change in our words. We'll never see perfection in our lives until we attain to that perfection in our mouth. That's the challenge. You know what the assignment is? You know what it means to, to be a believer? Do you want to know where faith begins? In your mouth. Even before you're able to walk it out, talk it out. Even while you're lighting up that cigarette, speak the word of God. Speak it. Speak it. Speak it. I'm no longer under the dominion of my sins. Speak it. Speak it. You're waiting for him to change before you say it and it's the other way around you got to say it before you see it everyone bow your heads today oh father in the mighty name of Jesus we see where our error has been we don't lack zeal we've got the zeal we we got the passion and the desire We've been operating without knowledge, without understanding. We see now, Father, that the key to change is in our mouth, in our mouths. Father, I'm praying today, I pray today that you would loose the tongue of your people. I serve notice on every principality, every power, every demonic force. I bind you in the mighty name of Jesus. Take your hand off of their mouths in Jesus' name. Take your hand off of their mouth. Somebody needs to say that. Take your hand off of my mouth in the name of Jesus. Take your hand off of my mouth. Remove the muzzle from my mouth. I command this muzzle to be removed from my mouth. I command my tongue to be loosed in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I will decree, I will declare, and I will confess the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Of the Lord. Whatever he says, I will say. I will not let the word depart out of my mouth. But I will speak it and I will declare it. Holy Spirit, help me. To keep this word in my mouth. Holy Spirit, sanctify my mouth in Jesus' name. Take out of my mouth cursings and swearings. Take out of my mouth doubts and unbelief. And cause me, Spirit of the living God, to speak 
the word of faith. I thank you today. Hallelujah. Oh, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He says, he didn't just call it the word. Don't let the word depart of your mouth. He called it the word of faith. Give me what to say. Let me hear you. Thank you for listening. If this teaching has been a blessing to you and you'd like to partner with our ministry to share the message of Jesus Christ, please visit our website at www.hmclive.org and click the donate button. If you're in our area, we invite you to join us at 4317 Lippincott Boulevard, Burton, Michigan, 48519. Harris Memorial Church of God in Christ, teaching the truth and showing the love. Use me, Lord.